don't apologize for your pricing. Be proud of it and look for the value. Don't discount first, value first, then think about if you need the discount. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal to stand in principle, now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for an eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts, cost 15 times the price. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the financial relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving. Today, our guest is Mike Wilkinson, and here are three things you want to know about Mike before we start. He is called the value selling expert, and that's pretty much all he works on. He's written a couple of books, most recent one being The Seven Challenges of Value, and he spends his days helping companies deliver and get paid for value. And, and by the way, I think he was guest number three on our podcast series. Uh, so welcome back, Mike, for your second visit. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, and Thanks a lot, Mark. It's a pleasure to be back. So we had a, a chance to just chat a little bit beforehand, and uh, and it's always fun talking to you. We were laughing and all, but I wanted to talk a little bit about ROI calculators. Uh, you're the one who put me on to Mike Farber, who we had on the podcast a few weeks ago, and and I thought he was brilliant. I thought he did a great job, um, but I saw a gap in ROI calculators. And, and that's what you and I started talking about. So let's let's revisit that conversation and then take it a little bit deeper. So in my view, the gap is most ROI calculators help us understand how, how and if we want to make a will I decision. So yeah. is buying this thing going to give me good ROI or not? And it doesn't go on to the next step, which says, okay, which one will I buy once I've said, yes, I need to buy one of these things. Um, and so let me just pause there and say, what do you think of that thought? Yeah, I, I, as we were saying, I think it's a really interesting thought, actually. Um, just before we move on, I have to say that the thing that I like most about Michael's ROI calculator is it's simple. And, you know, these are things that we're going to put in the hands of salespeople who I think actually run the risk of being inundated with ridiculously complicated tools that they are never ever going to use so the thing i liked about michael's was i can see people using that i mean i use it uh, I, I just think it's a really simple tool but you're right what it does help you to do is to make the decision should i do something is there value in my doing this it doesn't necessarily answer the question which one should i choose to help me to do it However, as you and I both said, the one thing as first movers that we're going to have is we will have established the credibility. So you might be fortunate enough never get to a point where they make that comparison because you've convinced them of the value of your solution up front. Yeah, and I actually think it's bigger than first mover, to tell you the truth, because imagine that uh, somebody's coming to us and we're the second or third person that they've looked at, but nobody before has really helped them understand value. Hmm. And we sit down and truly help them understand what does value mean and how do you do this? And, and we're helping them sell up, up the chain inside their own company to say, hey, here's why we need to make this decision. I think we leapfrog the competition when we do that. I, I completely agree. And I think there's lots of examples where people still fail to either understand the value that the customer is looking for, assuming the customer understands what that value is, um, and our ability to then communicate it. But I think that that's really all part of that, the value discovery conversation. I think the value discovery conversation is so much more than just having a chat to establish customer needs. I, I really think it is about taking the customer on a journey of value discovery, helping them to understand the things that they actually do need, the, the possibilities, the challenges that they have, what impact those are having on their business. Because very often when, well, certainly when I'm sitting down with people, sometimes they're, they are making discoveries during the conversation that they had never thought about. I think that is, makes all the sense in the world. When I think about value conversations is what I call them. But when I think about these value conversations, I often describe them to people as there is no way your customer knows how much value they're going to get from your product because they don't know your product that well. Mm -hmm. And there's no way that you know how much value your customer is going to get from your product because you don't know that customer's situation that well. And if the two of you sit together and try to figure out what does value mean to us, 
both of you are going to learn and it takes both of you to actually have this conversation and discover truly how much value there's going to be yeah and you'll know that you may well remember that my definition of value is that value is a mystery and i think when i first, when we were first utilizing that it was all about us as salespeople having to solve that value mystery that was our number one job. If value is a mystery, we need to understand what customers value. We need to solve the value mystery. But I think you're right. It is far more um, a, a conversation between us to help solve the value mystery for both of us, for the buyer as well as for the seller. Yeah, and so I often think that salespeople should understand this thing we call business acumen. And I say the word business acumen as in, if I understand my customer's business, then I can help them figure out how they make or save more money by using my product. Oh, now, this is exactly what an ROI calculator does. Yeah. But, but if it's business acumen, I don't even need an ROI calculator. I just need to know where to look for value. Look, if I, I mean, in using a, a tool, excuse me, a tool like the value triad, I cannot have a conversation with a customer and demonstrate to the customer how I can help them to move, improve their revenue if I have no idea where they generate revenue. And I certainly can't help to demonstrate how I can save them money, reduce their costs, if I have no idea where they incur cost. So I have to have that business acumen of understanding how the hell the customer's business works. You know, where does their income come from? Where do their costs come from? Because if I don't understand either of those, I'm just shooting in the wind. Yep, yep. Okay, Mike, you said that you do value conversations or ROI calculators with your clients, with your potential clients. And I, I wanna push you on this because I want you to coach me. I wanna learn how to do this better. Yeah. <laughs> and... <laughs> I, I think... Um... <clears throat> The starting point for me is taking this customer on that, that value journey, not getting into starting to talk about what you perceive to be the benefits too early on in the process. You have to understand the challenges, the issues, the problems, the opportunities the customer has. And I think you need to have explored with them the impact on their business of failing to address them. And even, even at that point, we should be monetizing that so that they need to recognize the downsides of not doing something before they then recognize the potential upside of actually addressing it. Um, so when I look at the, the value calculator, I think that comes for me at any rate, a little bit later on. I know some people use a value, cater, value calculator right up front to hit the customer with this is all the, all the fabulous things that you can get. I don't know, I think often in the way I, I tend to approach it, I think that's, that's too much of a, this is what we can do for you bit before I've actually understood exactly what it is the customer actually needs done. I think they need to know that we can add value. I think that perhaps a very quick case study of how we've helped somebody else might help, but I'm, I don't really think I'm ready to explain to you, for example, exactly how much money I'm gonna help you make or how much cost I'm gonna help you reduce until I understand your business in a bit more detail. And then I think it is about sitting down and together, as much as you can, together going through that conversation. So if I'm with a sales director, for example, I might say, well, how many, just as a matter of how many salespeople do you have? What's their average target, each of them, for the year? How many deals do they close in a year? What's each of those deals worth? So very quickly, you can begin to come up with some numbers which say that we need to close that number of deals of that value. What, how many deals are you pursuing every year? How many are you winning? How many are you, it's that just taking them through that structured conversation. And I have to say, every time I do that, even with, with sales directors that you'd expect to have their finger on the pulse, it almost always makes them sit back and go, wow, I hadn't actually thought of it quite like that. <clears throat> yeah, I got to say that almost, that almost sounds embarrassing in that I would expect sales directors to do that every day. Yeah, but, but, yeah. but you know they don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a, <laughs> there's, there's a hell of a big, big gap between expectation and reality. And, and often it's because there are so many things going on 
that stop them doing some of the things that you'd expect them to be doing as a, a sort of matter of course. I'd expect sales directors to be spending huge amounts of their time coaching their teams. That would not be a bad thing either. Yeah. It would be a wonderful thing, Mark, <laughs> but, but, but it doesn't happen. <laughs> but it doesn't okay. happen as much as it should. So I want to tie what we're talking about right now back to what we started talking about in the beginning. And that was this gap in ROI calculators. And, and I'm going to do it in the following sense. Um, you and I, as pricing people, we can probably, or value people, I'm sorry, uh, we can probably move. Okay. I'm, not a, I'm not a pricing person. <laughs> <laughs> we could probably move revenue of a company uh, conservatively 1% without even changing a cost structure, right? That's super conservative. So now you take a billion dollar company and you move the number 1%, that's $10 million. Now, if I could go through the value conversation, I can convince you I can do this, I can make a $10 million impact on your business. And I say, and I can do that for only a million dollars. Here's the problem. They look at me and they go, you, a million dollars? No, 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 I could hire Joe over there and he's gonna do it for 100,000. And so suddenly we're making a which one decision even though I convince them that, oh my God, this is something that you need to go do. So how do we address something like that? I think both the, the instant answer is that it's not easy, but it's about, I think it's about establishing trust. It's about establishing credibility. It's about generating that perception of risk. If, I, if I've done the journey with you and taken you on that value journey, and they've got to a point where they think, yeah, I can actually do this. I can actually generate an additional $10 million worth of business. Uh, then I should have built the trust and credibility to make them think, hang on a minute, there is a risk associated with going with somebody else. And what's at risk isn't the difference between my million and their 100,000. It's the difference between uh, my million and 10 million or their 1,000 and uh, 10 million. So there's a big, big gap. And I, I think you're, you're down. Logic says, if somebody says to you, I can do it for 100,000, and I'm saying to you, I can do it for a million, logic says, well, you've been wrong in your head to go for the guy who's trying to charge you a million dollars. 100,000 is a much better deal. Especially if there are multiple people offering the 100K-ish price point. And, Absolutely. And it but really the, comes down to, does the buyer believe that the products are similar or, or not? Well, the, the bottom line is, if the products are the same and you have no other differentiation, and I can demonstrate that my $100,000 product will give you the £10 million return, then you'd be wrong in your head to pay me $10 million. Oh, sorry, a million dollars. Well, actually, yep. They'd be delighted yep. for you to pay me. So the, the question is, where is your differentiation? How do I yep. differentiate why you should pay me a million dollars when you could buy it from somebody else from 100,000? So I have to have a differentiation. Now, what a lot of salespeople forget is one of the biggest differentiators is themselves. Just the sheer feeling of... Um, uh, of comfort people get with dealing with somebody that they know, they trust, they like, they respect. That is still massively valuable, but you have to be able to deliver. I'm not going to buy from you just because I like you. Yeah, I think that the salesperson could get you, and, and I'm just making this up, but I think the salesperson could probably get you 10%, 20% more because of the relationship, because of the way that they've done their job. 10x more, I don't think the salesperson could pull that one off. No, that's going to be pretty damn tough. Right. But but that brings us back to where I really wanted this to go. And that is, I'm now charging $900,000 more. Mm -hmm. I better have real differentiation here that my buyers believe. What's the ROI of the differentiation? Well, that's it, isn't it? Because what I'm asking you to do, if I'm asking you to pay me a million and somebody else is going to do it for 100,000, effectively what you're asking yourself is, what am I going to get for my additional $900,000 investment? And if I don't have a really good answer to that question, then the answer is thanks, but no thanks, we'll go with $100,000 because it, it's, it's common sense. So yes. I have to have yes. the answer to that. 
I mean, I, I, I do find that frequently. I mean, if you, if you, you know, with with sellers who've got products who are perhaps not quite that much more expensive, but it, you know, if if I if my product is ten dollars and yours is five dollars, I still have to come up with a reason why you spend five dollars more with me. What am I going to get back for that additional five dollar investment that I'm not going to get if I just buy the five dollar option? Yes. And now we're back to the gap in the ROI calculator. Because what that just yes. said to me is, I've got this differentiation, I'm charging $5 more. Are you getting more than $5 worth of value because you pay me $5 more? And now what's the ROI? I mean, if ROI I cannot demonstrate that? that, yeah, if I cannot demonstrate mm -hmm. that, and I can't demonstrate an ROI, I'm going to say, well, thanks, but no thanks. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And don't forget that differentiation, the thing about differentiation, as I always say, being different isn't differentiation. Differentiation is being different in ways that delivers real value to the customer. So again, I go back to the fact that if you do not understand your customers in infinite detail, if you haven't taken them on that value discovery journey effectively, then your ability to defend your prices against this kind of downward pricing pressure is going to be much, much harder. Now, I have to say, I think being able to defend your prices against a $900,000 downward price pressure could be something of a struggle. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are talking quite a big gap there. Uh, but under normal circumstances, yeah, the, the question is, do you have a differentiation that has value for the customer and that you can use as your defense against downward pricing pressure? Because if the answer is no, you don't, then all you're left with is price. And you have to make a decision then was whether you want to drop your price or not. Yep, absolutely. I'm loving this conversation, Mike. So how do you, uh, do you coach your companies, your clients to create a list of places where they're looking for value when they go talk to their clients, their potential customers? Uh, yes, I do actually. Um, we have we have a concept that, that I call generic issues. And uh, generic issues are all the, all the issues you can imagine a customer in a particular business segment is likely to face. And you understand them because that, that's what happens with all the customers you go to. You know these are the things that you're going to find. Now, the next question is, can we actually do anything to add value in these areas? Because, because somebody's got an issue doesn't mean we can do anything about it. So we need to be making sure that we're targeting the sweet spots from our point of view, where we actually truly believe that we can add something to the client experience that adds real value to what they are doing and often that means adds value to what they're doing for their clients. So, yeah, I do coach them a lot. So we will spend time thinking about, right, what are the issues that you actually solve for your clients? What is the value that you deliver to your clients? But there's one caveat that I always add about this, and that is there is a danger now that you've gone through that thought process that you go straight in and you lead with it. <laughs> so you straight into that, that product. And I say, no, 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 no. That's not what you're doing. The whole reason for understanding what the issues are almost certainly going to be is that you can now test those assumptions in, a, in an educated way. The customer will know straight away that you've given some thought to the conversation and you're not talking about you, you're focusing absolutely on the customer and their challenges. Um, so I, I think thinking about value and thinking about the value that you believe that you can deliver to your customers is hugely important but you need to take a step back from that in the initial stages of the conversation with you have you you're having with your client. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I think that people, salespeople in particular, want to go pitch their product, want to go pitch their benefits. Yeah. And and the problem that we really have is we don't know what resonates with our buyers. We don't know what matters no to them. No and so idea. if we've got this, if we've got this list of, let's use the word value drivers for a second, and all of a sudden I hear the buyer say, Yeah, our turnover rate's too high. Ding, ding, ding. I've got that one on my list of, of value drivers. I happen to know how to turn turnover into dollar value using my business acumen. Let me walk you through that, Mr. Customer. And, and that just makes a lot of sense to do it that way instead of, hey, do you have a turnover problem? Let me help you with turnover. I still think, 
<laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I completely agree. I, I still think it's probably too early to come up with the solution. I, again, I, I, I don't know whether this translates into American, but I, have, I think lots of salespeople operate on what I call rat up a drain pipe selling. Um, I don't know whether, whether that translates well into, but it's, it's actually just hearing something and thinking, Eureka, I've got a solution to that and going with it rather than just saying, right, that's really interesting. I'll, I'll make a note to that. Now, are there any other issues that you're facing right now? And then getting the list, because what I want to see at the end of a really good and effective value discovery journey with a customer is the ability for the seller at the end of that process to say, right, Mr. Customer, let me just summarize my understanding. Uh, the big issues that you're facing right now are this, this, and this, and the impact that they're having on your business is so-and-so. And I think we've agreed that there is some real benefit in actually beginning to address those. Yes. So yep. the next thing I want is, so are you committed to doing something about this? Yep. And I think that was beautiful. And I agree completely that we're not trying to pitch the solutions. We're trying to, to document and understand value. How big is the problem, right? Is someone going to spend money trying to solve this problem or not? Now, it, it, it's down to that classic pain stuff, isn't it? You know, if the pain isn't big enough, I'm not going to change because, you know, it's a bit like going to the dentist. Yeah, there is nothing which will get me to the dentist until the pain is great enough that I go, hell, I've got to go and do it. <laughs> okay, I was going to make a British joke here, but I chose against it. <laughs> Feel free. I was... <laughs> Feel free. So um, how do you coach or teach people to do the following? As a salesperson, I've gone in, I've got my list of, you know, there's probably 20 value drivers here, but there's five of them that are usually really important and my customer tells me three of them. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking, this is awesome. Do you recommend that you say something like, you know, other customers that I've talked with also feel this pain. Is this an issue for you or not? Mm. I think the answer to the question is very often, I probably count them to say to do that. And let's just see where the priorities are. Uh, at the end of the day, what I do want to say to them is, look, we've identified a number of issues that seem to be important for you. But if you were to prioritize, prioritize those, which would be the really important ones from your point of view? So I think I'd probably look to, to exclude things um, rather than necessarily add loads and loads. I think that the reality is we both know that every business we ever come across has got hundreds of issues hundreds of them, the vast majority of which they will never, ever do anything about, because frankly, they never get that high up the priority list for them. Um, you know, and they get they get used to them, they find workarounds, they find ways of actually dealing with them. Those are not the ones we want to be looking at, we want to be looking at the ones that we can make them perceive to be a real priority to them to address. And those that need to be the ones that we could do something about. Yes, yes. I think the only exception that I would give to that, as I think through the process, is if I'm talking to someone who's not a CEO, right? The CEO says this is the priority. Okay, that's the priority. I get it. Mm. But if I'm talking to someone who says, look, the priority is I need to make this more efficient, but we don't really have the ROI there to be able to justify it up the chain. Now what I want to do is help that person find more ROI so that they can justify it up the chain. And, yes. and so I could see that as a process, but the idea that says, let's let you choose what's important and let's talk about that. Love that. Yeah, I, th I think it, it, going back to the point that you make again, <laughs> I, I think when you're taking people on this journey of value discovery, sometimes they fail to really, really understand the implications of some of the problems that they have. They've never actually sat down and really monetized the impact on the business of the issue that they've got. Now, that's not to say, of course, that every time we do that, we're going to come up with a winner. Of course it isn't. Yep. Um, but it, but it, what it does do is it does take them, it opens their eyes sometimes to what the impact really is. Uh, and I, I love the old concept of, uh, of what a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, Peter Thompson, calls the magic formula, which is what's it cost you this month? $5,000. So that's $60,000 a year. That's absolutely right. How long has this been going on for? Well, a couple of years at least. So it's not a $60,000 problem, then it's about 
120, $180,000 problem. And if you don't do anything about it, how much longer would you expect it to continue and get a number out of that? So instead of the $5,000 a month problem, you've now got a $240,000 problem that is a lot more interesting to work with. Uh, that's, it's just a great way of actually building up the perception of pain. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Mike, we are uh, running out of time. I have so enjoyed this conversation as always, but final question for you. What's one piece of pricing advice you would give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? Employ somebody who knows what they're doing. <laughs> I'm not a price. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a pricer. But I tell you, the one piece of advice that I always give to, to, to sales guys is be proud of your price. Don't apologize for your pricing. Be proud of it and look for the value. Don't discount first, value first, then think about if you need the discount. Yep. Love that. Love that. Great answer. Um, Mike, thank you so much for your time today. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? Uh, easiest way, I guess, is mwmikewhiskey at axiavalue.com. And Axia is A-X-I-A. It is A-X-I, as you and I talked about just before we came on, <laughs> your spelling A-X-I-A, axiavalue.com. That's it. Per perfect. Episode number 140 is all done. Uh, wow. Thank you for listening. I, that's amazing. We started with number three. I know, isn't it, though? So that means it's been uh, well yes, over two years. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. Yes. <laughs> well, to our listeners, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, would you please leave us a rating and a review? They're very valuable to us. Um, thank you uh, for listening. And if you have any questions or comments about the podcast or pricing in general, feel free to email me, mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact.